Morning, Peter. Can I test the audio, please? Can I get an audio check? Good morning, Councillor Pileshi. You're coming through loud and clear. Thanks, Peter. Councillor Keenan here. Just want to do the same. Councillor Keenan, you're coming through loud and clear. We also see online Councillor Medeiros, Councillor Brar, and Councillor Tour. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, councillors. We'll get underway just momentarily. Of our budget committee uh, meeting, I will let the clerk do. Uh, do we need to do roll call or just continuation? Through you, Mr. Chair. So just for the record, all members are present. Um, in person is Councillor Power, Deputy Mayor Singh, Councillor Santos, Councillor Basante. Yourself online is Councillor Brar, Councillor Medeiros, Councillor Paleshi, Councillor Keen Keenan, Councillor Tour, and the only member absent at the moment is Councillor Fortini. Okay. And because we did the um, declaration of interest yesterday. We need to do that again? Okay, good. Okay, so we're just continuing. So the next item on the agenda um, would be the corporate support services. Um, corporate support services is first up. Don't mind, Alex. I'm just gonna lower this to a reasonable height. This. Uh, no, I got it. Thanks. <laughs> uh, good morning, Mayor Brown and uh, members of Council. I'm pleased to be uh, presenting the Corporate Support Services budget for 2023 uh, to the Budget Committee today. Um, if everybody's ready, we'll get right into it. I think it is Murphy's Law that the department responsible for IT would have technical issues. <laughs> so thank you, uh, thank you again this morning. I just want to, uh, I want to start by saying uh, I want to turn the perspective a little bit for corporate support services. I know uh, so far in the budget we've focused on uh, departments that provide services outward uh, to the residents of, of our fi uh, fine city. Uh, our department really focuses on providing services inward in supporting the rest of the department. So we are enablers. Uh, we enable corporate direction with uh, communication that promotes our strategic focus and our corporate values. 
We attract, retain, and develop talent. We steward the safeguarding of municipal assets and interests, and we assume financial responsibility. We leverage corporate information and advanced technology to deliver service excellence to our employees and to the growing and diverse community. So we are responsible for strategic communications, tourism events, human resources, finance, purchasing, and digital innovation and information technology. Our budget drivers are uh, very much uh, the same as what you've heard from the rest of the departments so far. Uh, there is high inflation and lending rates, and population growth pressures, uh, rapidly changing provincial policies that we're faced with. We have a loss in traditional revenue uh, sources. But more, uh, more prevalent, I think, in, in this group, we've had an increased uh, level of threats in cybersecurity, and we have increased public engagement in community events uh, driven by the last two terms of council, or this term of council and the previous, which I think is a fantastic thing for, uh, for the city, but of course does have implications. So our goals through this budget process are really to align with the organizational growth. We've proposed moderate operational budget increases and moderate staffing increases uh, that will help reflect the growth that has happened across other parts of the organization and allow us to provide adequate support to them. We are right-sizing our capital. Uh, we've taken a very deep cut into our uh, IT capital, especially this year, to, um, to reflect really the amount of money that we've historically spent uh, rather than uh, promising you know, millions of dollars over what we know we can deliver. We want to have agile and responsive procurement so we can move ahead with some of the capital projects that have been on the books for some time. We're in the process right now of uh, modernizing our uh, policies and our tendering documents. Uh, we'll be bringing a new purchasing bylaw to council this year which will uh, have opportunities for improvement and for uh, leaning out the process. We are also working with the PMO office so that's been brought up already, I think, um, yesterday. And we are working with them very closely at mapping out the existing process and finding opportunities uh, for improvement. And then, of course, continuous improvement. Council may have already seen uh, a survey or two come out from directors within our department that have asked for some feedback uh, we're going to take that feedback uh, to heart and we're going to look at ways that we can improve our service delivery to, uh, to the other departments. So in order to support this, uh, we have asked for in total 13 positions. I do want to highlight that uh, six of these positions will come at uh, no impact to the tax base and really are providing... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, sustain, not sustainable, uh, um, we're converting uh, contract positions to full-time. So we're taking what is precarious employment and we're, uh, and we're changing that into full-time positions, uh, which will be better able to support our organization, we'll see less turnover. Uh, so that'll be six and there's a, a net zero impact to those already. We have two positions that were approved in mid-year 2022 without funding. Uh, so we're back at the budget committee this year uh, to request funding for those. Uh, one is the uh, advisor for talent acquisition, which will help uh, help to support our group in fire uh, and the uh, changing requirements to recruiting there. And the employment and labor lawyer, uh, of course, that was approved last year, will be offset by the uh, contracted legal fees that we're paying presently. And then we have... Um, Net new positions uh, being technical analyst for visual technologies, uh, two HR business partners, again, to support growth across the organization, uh, advisor for sustainable procurement, and a senior buyer as well in purchasing. And uh, Councillor Pileshi, in, in anticipation of you asking, we have uh, filled all of the positions that were requested in the 2022 budget. Uh, we do have one position that was filled and then subsequently vacated, uh, and we are recruiting for that now in the IT division. So our, our operating highlights, uh, you'll see an increase uh, overall from last year in several of the uh, IT-related uh, um, Operating costs, we have an increase, uh, increase in our Microsoft products and services of 518,000. 
We have additional proactive cybersecurity of 440,000, and of course our sports tourism and marquee events, uh, which was already brought to council at an, um, a modest increase, but the, uh, the total cost being 245,000. Uh, new or enhanced uh, services that we're providing uh, include increased video production capacity of 240,000 in our strategic communications group. Uh, we have a, a Diwali fireworks event estimated at 200,000, uh, key to the city events at 75,000, and then the backyard rink competition at 25. And this is uh, highlighted again just in the, in the charts that you see before you. The, the majority of our uh, costs within corporate support services, again, is staffing costs. Um, we, we do not uh, turn out products. Our value proposition is really support of the organization. And in order to do that properly, uh, we need the staff uh, to uh, deliver those services. So from a capital perspective, uh, the majority of our capital is uh, dedicated to the digital innovation and IT uh, group. So we have 1.3 million for managing and maintaining citywide corporate business solutions. We have 2.4 million for technology infrastructure and 0 0.5 million for preventative maintenance across the organization. Uh, finance also has 0 0.4 million for DC bylaw and background study. Uh, we'll be bringing a uh, new development charge bylaw to council in this term as well. And again, that is just uh, indicated through the uh, chart and table before you. I do wanna highlight before we end uh, that there was a referred matter uh, to bring back to the budget committee this year related to uh, funding for um, Habitat for Humanity. The full motion is, is on the screen in front of you, but I do wanna let you know that with the passage of Bill 23, Habitat for Humanity uh, and any non nonprofit uh, organization that are building homes are exempt from DCs and CIL uh, now. So this referred matter does not really need to be dealt with. It has been dealt with through the Bill 23. So that is my hopefully succinct uh, presentation for you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, I don't see any questions on the board. Are there questions in the room? No, thank you. Oh, Councillor Santos. <laughs> thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. This won't be news in terms of the, the questions I'm gonna ask because I've asked them in various budget um, sort of pre-briefings beforehand. But on the communication side, um, so there is a lot happening at the City of Brampton, not just within our individual departments, but in terms of events, in terms of various new recreation programs, what's happening in transit, um, things that, that the mayor's office is doing, things that the councillor's offices are doing. And um, I don't know 100%, and actually I, I, I know 100%, that many of the residents don't know what's going on. And so, while we focus on social media and videos, which is super important, um, what is our plan and do we have enough resources to actually get to the residents themselves? It's very often, even when we sh have social media posts and then we, we, sh we show the various events or announcements after the fact, residents just don't know. They're like, I didn't know about this. Like, or, or even um, as for the past two and a half years or three years, we've been talking so much about revitalization of downtown Brampton, for example, and all the work that we're doing behind the scenes to plan for a revitalized downtown. And even the small businesses in downtown still to this day say to me, Councillor, we have no idea what's going on. So how do we improve the impact of our communications so that we have some sort of measurability um, that it's hitting the ground through the right channels? And do we have enough resources to actually make that happen on top of all the work that we're doing in the various departments? Through, through you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Councillor. We, uh, in, in the additional or supplemental information that was circulated uh, yesterday, there, there is uh, a portion in there that speaks to additional resources in, in communications. Uh, in, you know, in a perfect world where 
um, you know, funding was available, uh, we would certainly take additional resources in order to drive uh, community engagement and, and communications uh, across the city. Uh, however, we do recognize that, you know, there are a lot of uh, pressures facing residents in, in tax increases. So if we're looking at providing uh, additional resources in, in communications, uh, we would have to look likely at uh, offsetting that somehow yeah. uh, across the operating uh, budget. So that, that is something we can take back and, and take a look at if you feel that if the budget committee as a whole feels that additional resources would be warranted. In terms of a plan, uh, I will ask uh, Jason to, uh, to answer that question. If there is a little bit more of a plan put in place to measure the level of engagement uh, in, in this term of council and, and how we can improve that and how we can have higher impact on, on the efforts that we are putting forward with our communications. Uh, Jason, are you available? Thank you. I, I thought you were going to be to my left. <laughs> Uh, thanks, and through the chair, I, I would say, um, so in that supplemental information, there's uh, potentially, if committee, it's not in the budget, but if committee deems fit, um, there'd be an additional uh, resource to support social, our social media work, and, and you mentioned that some people don't always see that, so an additional effort um, that the team does a great job, but uh, there's just uh, a lot of work going on in the projects that the councillor mentioned. So an additional resource for social media, an additional resource for media relations and storytelling and really mm -hmm. pitching to outlets and getting our stories out there, not just pushing material out and hoping people pick it up. Uh, and then thirdly would be a, a, a potential additional support to uh, help with enhanced communications around economic development and mm -hmm. all the work going on there. Yeah. So that would be the three I'd recommend if that's the committee's wish. Um, and. As far as measurement, I, I, I can speak to, uh, like our, and you can see it in the service plans that are appended to the budget, uh, our creative services are up. Um, I think it's 400 additional projects this year over last and the same over the last year with no new resources in that space. Yeah. Um, so they're doing a lot, lot yeah. more with no additional bodies. Uh, and similarly around our media releases, we're up uh, almost 100, maybe more over the prior year and we don't have additional resources in that space. Mm -hmm. So the, the numbers may support it, but uh, I would leave it to the committee to decide. If yeah. And through you, um, Mr. Chair, and, and the, the comm staff do do a fantastic job, and I think you're right, they're doing a, a, a great job um, pushing the material through, creating the material um, on uh, and not having the additional resources despite us increasing events, despite us increasing projects, despite us um, having to deal with Bill 23 and, and more economic development and business investment. Despite all that, we've had no increases in, in, in comm staff and resources, and they are doing um, a really good job. But we have other things that are coming up that are going to be very um, comms heavy. And I think the key measurability, and I don't know how we do this uh, in, the, in, the, in the new term, but reaching out to residents to find out how they heard or if they heard um, and understanding whether or not um, what we are doing on, on the comp side is actually hitting, hitting the ground. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it is and it's increased impressions on social media, um, but how do we improve it with the resources but also count, uh, measurabilities to make sure that they're, it's, hit, it's getting to the, to the residents who need to hear it. Um, so, for example, Bill 23, we don't, there's so much uncertainty. So many residents don't know what the impact is going to be, and they need to know. Um, and, and we need the resources in communications in order to tell that particular story. The branding issue and, and the, the 50th birthday of Branton, telling our story as Branton, I, I don't know if you have enough resources in, in comms to actually um, to fulfill uh, the expectations um, on that one either. So I would, I do support, I'm, I'm happy to hear uh, Councillor Pleshek, because he's been asking a lot of questions on the comm side too. Happy to support um, something moving forward, but uh, we'll wait to hear from some of my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councillor Pleshek. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thanks, Rick. And, um, Jason, um, 
communications and, um, and engagement, two very separate things that I feel. And I think that your department, given the resources that you have, have done an excellent job at uh, communications. Um, engagement is something that a lot of the other departments, I find, handle on their own. Um, and you'll notice that I've been asking each department about uh, comms and, and engagement and budgets that are associated to, to each department. Um, and I'm trying to wonder if, you know, we're better served to have, you know, one central engagement. I find that, you know, engaging with the community is, uh, is the greatest benefit. Um, you know, getting, getting information out is, is huge, but, um, Engagement is like almost forcing them to read it, engaging with the uh, with the community. So I'm not I'm not anywhere where I, I think we should be doing something. Um, but what I'd like to try and understand is, um, in terms of communications, do you hold budgets in other departments under under your budget for comms? Um, so through. Uh through some previous decisions under under different leadership, uh, marketing was centralized, so it's now a part of our communications budget, and that so that includes uh, funding for recreation, economic development, transit uh, specifically, and so those budgets we work closely with those operating departments and our senior advisors with their teams and CLT members to really map out the year, what that spend would look like, but it's centralized kind of from a consistency in how we spend and how we uh, approach whatever those marketing projects look like. Uh, so that's the marketing piece. I could just speak to the engagement piece as well. So we have two full-time FTEs in the comms team uh, and then two FTEs that have that as part of their daily work. Uh, so that's for the corporation and then um, other teams may have some people that are kind of closer to the um, work product maybe, so perhaps in, in recreation they're, they're more expertise in just rec or yeah. just transit or something like that, so those people doing that engagement may uh, kind of, their ec expertise in that work. Mm -hmm. um, so they might not be centralized, but they, but they may also do that as part of their role and it not exclusively engagement, so it might be a, a bigger type of JD that has other elements to it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so within uh, each department's budget, then when they say they have 130,000, 100,000 uh, for for comms, you you take a role in that in that support of, of you know as you're the experts in the in the communications department you kind of support them in terms of what they're trying to achieve? Relative yeah, we'd, to what we'd meet with them. We, we've done an exercise where we get an annual comms plan for every operating department, and then we take that plan, look at it for the year, at least for 12 months out, at least what we can determine at this point. I mean, things like Bill 23 might happen and we don't know what's coming, but the things that we can control, we plan ahead for and then work closely with uh, them for any additional marketing dollars or events or anything else that would fall under my umbrella uh, to, to build that together for the for the year ahead. So the, there's a bigger um, undertaking like Bill 23 where you know we're, we're having a special council meeting we're trying to get you know the message out um, within planning you have your own separate uh, dollar amount in terms of you know how we're going to communicate some information um, but because of Bill 23 and just kind of thrown at us, um, or any others, let's say of planning, they come down with Bill 24, that's a complete train wreck. Um, and, then, and then budgets out, they don't have any more budget to push out any type of communication. Do you then subsidize, or do you come back to, uh, to council for, uh, for a budget amendment? I'd say it probably differs department to department. So with a lot of, uh, so for instance, for budget, uh, we, we would cover the cost for all the communications. A lot of, I'd say generally planning projects, you'll find that they'd, uh, Bill 23 aside, but a lot of the bigger projects, they'd build the, 
the communications costs in either with a consultant or working closely with us and they build the budget in so it would we could work with them on, on spending it uh, and, and doing the, the communications with residents and businesses, but that way uh, it'd kind of be built in. And if Steve, you want to add to that? Yeah, if I could, through uh, through the chair, um, to your question, Councilor Pelleschi, when it came to the Bill 23, Council will recall the um, creation of the task force. The funding of uh, all works uh, for that task force was um, basically through unspent capital dollars of being reconciled into one new capital account. That funding then could be used to work with STRATCOM on advocacy, uh, work to uh, look at financial implications, et cetera. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks, Jay. Rick? Um, uh, cybersecurity. Um, how, you have a, the new dollars in here, I think, equated to 400,000. Sorry, I was walking when you said that, and then I hit the elevator and I missed it. It was 400,000? I think it was 440,000. So yes. of total, how much money are we putting into, you know, the protection of the corporation through cybersecurity? And how much, how are we leveraging, um, you know, outside partners that are now coming into Brampton um, for the cybersecurity catalyst and all of the hopeful uh, newer companies that are coming out of Beehive. What are we doing on that aspect? Okay, if you uh, can give us a few seconds, we'll get you the total uh, budget spend on, sure. on cybersecurity. But um, with respect to uh, leveraging partners, uh, we've, uh, as you know, for the majority of uh, 2022, we, we didn't actually have a CIO. Uh, so our CIO, Adam, uh, started in October of last year. And he has uh, reached out, in particular, I know, uh, with regard to the uh, cybersecurity uh, issue to start develop uh, partnerships with people that we have coming into the organization. Uh, and we had this discussion, I think it was uh, last week or maybe the week before, uh, that uh, those conversations were, were starting and we were going to start leveraging uh, those partnerships where we can. Um, uh, Adam is on the line. Uh, Adam, is there anything that you wanted to add to, the, to this part of the conversation? Uh, sorry, uh, through, through the chair. Uh, thank you, Rick. Um, for sure, there's been um, a significant uh, focus uh, since I've uh, come on board in, in October. Um, in terms of security operations, we're spending or we plan to spend about 1.26 million. Uh, what I can tell you, um, and uh, I mean, I can't get into the details, but as I did share at uh, Audit Committee, that um, our number one priority this year will be on protecting the better protecting the corporation uh, cybersecurity is um, you know it's 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 a risk in, in a lot of things that we do and we're really uh, going to be driving that from uh, from the office of the cio um so and as rick mentioned also looking for opportunities to uh to leverage partnerships um uh, as many of you may know we we are d doing the work with uh, TMU and the and the Brampton Civic Center, um, so so certainly beginning to to, to uh, have conversations with them, um, certainly with our PSN partners. So that's the region and Caledon and Mississauga, and then any um, any opportunities we can to leverage the catalyst, the cybersecurity catalyst is, um, you know, from my perspective, I th I think considering where it's located. Uh, would make perfect sense for us to see what kind of partnership opportunities. But I do want to reassure this uh, the council that our our focus really is on cybersecurity, um, and and it will be moving forward. This isn't just a one one and done thing. I think it's you know we're always trying to stay one step ahead of the bad guys. So thank you. Thanks, Adam. Um, in terms of the. Uh, uh, the data center. Um, I recall in previous budgets that um, there was a lot of new monies that are allocated to upgrading the data center um, at the Civic Center. Um, where are we with that? What's what's happening with that uh, data center? Um, where is it going? Are we, have we potential lost? Have we potentially lost any monies that we've put into that over the years because it's moving? Or can you give me a well, the the data center that is at uh, the Civic Center is going to be remaining there, at least for the short term. Uh, there There is a long-term plan uh, being developed to uh, on how to deal with that, so we are still working on that in, in 
Uh, we are also developing, you know, a solution for a backup data center and, you know, for uh, a disaster recovery scenario. So uh, all of that money that was associated uh, with any capital uh, projects to, to make that move or to develop the plan are, are still in place or are uh, being used. Uh, we've had a consultant uh, that we've been working with to develop a solution or uh, options for a solution for disaster recovery uh, on that side of it with, the, with an additional uh, backup data center. But uh, in terms of the, the one at um, the Civic Center, we'll remain there uh, for, for the time being. Uh, we can come back with further information on a long-term plan for that uh, data center. Okay. And uh, the council office budget's within your portfolio? The council office budget? Yeah. It, uh, it's, it's within your portfolio. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, if you have questions on it, we can certainly have uh, Nash answer it or I can uh, attempt to answer it. Okay, but the council office falls under corporate services, right? No? The council office does not know. Where does it fall? It's separate. Uh, it was always in corporate services, wasn't it? With the clerk's office? It, not, I don't think so, no. Th no. Through you, Mr. Mr. Chair, it was in the clerk's office when the clerk's office uh, right. were responsible for staff supporting the council office uh, since the last start of the last term of council. It's a, what we call a independent or political support model, and I believe it's budgeted under general government. Okay. I'll hold my questions then for now. Thanks, Rick. You're welcome. Uh, you see Councillor Tor was on the line? Yes. Uh, Councillor Tor? Hi, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, question for Rick uh, regarding our, our um, IT systems. So, Yesterday was the first day of uh, <clears throat> registra registration for our recreation programs online, and I got a lot of complaints about it, like a lot. And and then I see we got a memo from staff saying that our systems were down, and and uh, we were encouraging people to um, email us regarding their registrations. Um, so it's a lot of parents. I don't know how we're handling that if people are emailing their registration requests. Um, and these registration requests not working out. Um, a lot of people are messaging me saying that um, it, it, they're, they're not even just upset about our registration, but they're upset when they look at uh, City of Brampton trying to, um, you know, we're trying to move ahead with economic development. We talk about our um, technology sector and all of that, but when it comes to our own IT systems, um, you know, a simple task is registration um, is it, very difficult to get done. So can like can you let us know what is going on with that and what we can do to prevent that in the future? Because I I don't want to see that again. Where, you know, it's a, it, people are in line since like 5 a.m. 6 a.m. attempting to go online trying to do this registration and then everything keeps crashing. Three, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Tour. Um, so we did not uh, actually have a crash of the system this time around. Uh, I know we experienced that in the fall last year with registration. Uh, there were additional server capacities built in to, uh, to uh, mediate that. And, uh, and, and so we did, not ha we did not have a system crash uh, this time around, but we did have a lot of delays. So there were people that were experiencing uh, extended delays. Uh, we had built uh, timeout uh, extensions into the system where it was typically, I think, five minutes in the past. It was extended to 15 uh, to allow the process to, to eventually go through. Uh, but there was uh, still uh, a lot of frustration uh, expressed in, in people who, you know, ended up being charged multiple times uh, for refreshing a page or leaving a page and coming back. Uh, so, so we do recognize that, and I know Community Services is looking at working with IT on uh, solutions for the future. Some of it may uh, may be non-IT related uh, solutions, like staggering registration days, so that everything is not happening on the same day. Uh, but we are we have partnered uh, with uh, with Recreation to come up with a solution to expand, uh, uh, you know, the uh, capabilities of our registration system. Um, Chief, did you want to add anything to that? I was uh, just going to add to Councillor Tor's point. We spoke about this yesterday. Um, we were inundated with complaints. I, I, last night before I was going to bed, I looked on Facebook and there were 71 messages just on this. And so as much as we say that there wasn't a server overload capacity, you know, I was getting screenshots of people where the screen just went dead. 
And so I don't know how you describe that if it's not over capacity. Um, and people saying that they were on hold for an hour and a half. I know the chief is very sensitive to this. We spoke about it several times last night. Um, but we have to find a solution. I think the solution is being identified. I know the city put out a post yesterday apologizing. Um, but uh, part of the problem is, and I know this is not really budget for next year, but there's people who were waiting an hour and a half, the system crashed, and they have screenshots saying that it crashed, and their child doesn't have a recreation spot now. And so I hope there's some, you know, when Councilor Tor is talking about this, I hope there's some dispute resolution process we can have um, to try to uh, help those people that uh, for somehow the system didn't work for them yesterday. I know there might have been 7,000 successfully processed, but when you get 71 messages on one social media platform alone, um, where people are feeling helpless, um, it's a problem. And so Councillor Santos spoke about this yesterday, Councillor Torres talking about it today. I'm pretty sure every member of council got inundated with complaints about this. So, you know, we just, it has to be fixed. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I believe uh, we do recognize that it does need to improve and, and we will uh, certainly be working on a solution. Uh, Rick, Rick, just to address the comment from you and the same thing that the mayor said, I've got the same screenshots where the, the site crashes, like that is legitimately what is happening. So um, I, I'm not I'm not too happy to go back and tell people that our service didn't crash because there 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 is a problem with that. I see uh, Adam has been waving his hand at at us now for a little while. Adam, <laughs> did you want to speak to this? <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Uh, to you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to be clear. We all understand how important this is, and we're all very uh, equally frustrated. This is, um, although we collectively have accountability for this uh, between our, our partners in recreation and IT, um, but it is a it is a vendor issue, and actually, we're going through uh, today a major incident uh, review process, and certainly, um, you know, as was mentioned before. Part of the solution might be uh, a non-technology solution in terms of maybe divvying up the days for um, uh, you know registration. But but we are. Uh, I just want to reassure you, it wasn't. It, I know this doesn't. It's not cold comfort. It wasn't actually a city of Brampton issue. It was a vendor issue, and so we really are working uh, again with our recreation uh, partners to, um, to to make sure that we we hold that vendor accountable. And, uh, and that we find ways collectively to make sure that this doesn't happen in the future. Uh, I, I was not very happy when, when I saw this happening because like most of us thought we had this uh, solution uh, last year when, when a similar thing happened. Um, just so you know, from my experience, for example, in Saskatoon, we had similar issues too. So this is, this is not, I don't think this is necessarily a city of Brampton thing, but, but I think it's, uh, we have to be very um, aware of the fact that when you have thousands and thousands of people coming in at the same point, you know that that there, you know there is the potential for capacity issues. So, uh, as, as I said, we're working very closely with our recreation partners to make sure that uh, next registration period this does not happen again. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Adam and. Uh, I hope we can we can discuss this after budget again um, on on what's been done about this um, to prevent this problem because again I I understand we can say that it's not a city of Brampton issue and a vendor issue and that that's the that's the technicality of it but anything that is not a uh, issue from the resident side uh, it, it 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 is a city of Brampton issue and that's why we get all these complaints so I hope that after budget we can circle back on this and and have an answer on what we can do going forward whether it's staggering the dates whatever we can work out but we really need to have a solution for this one and if there's no uh, impact to the budget about this then um, I'm I'm happy about that and we can discuss it after budget yeah Councillor Tor, the only uh, budget aspect may be for um the people that the system crashed on, the residents the system crashed on, uh, their children that, that didn't get into a recreation spot. And if there needs to be an additional allocation, maybe that's now is the time to ask and to, to Chief Boys, for the people that can show the system crashed on them and their, their child is without a recreation spot, how do we solve that? 
<coughs> uh, through the mayor, maybe what we can do is take that back and see if there's an opportunity to get them into other potential programs. Uh, one thing we're limited by, we spoke about yesterday, is the number of staff we have. So we might not be able to offer all the programs based on the demand, but we can certainly look at programs that aren't full, that may be complementary, to see if there's a way that we could work with the resident to get them into. So, so Chief, uh, when um, so all the residents right now, we're asking them to email that uh, particular email address if they had had problems with registrations. Uh, that's where we should direct people so that um, your division can take care of communicating with them and figuring out uh, at least some programs for their children. Uh, through the chair, yeah, that's uh, recreation at brampton.ca. That's correct. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so uh, Councillor Plesher just made a good point. Um, is it possible that there are residents from other cities that are trying to register their children um, for the Brampton Recreation Programs? Uh, through the mayor, that may be possible that they're trying, but we have it blocked off uh, and there's certain parameters in there that they have to be a Brampton resident. Uh, we open it up for Brampton residents, I believe it's 14 days now. Uh, in advance, but I, I believe our director of recreation is on, uh, Anand Patel. Uh, we can confirm, but we haven't opened it up for non-residents. It is 14 days after, but I can let him weigh in if I'm missing anything. So I would certainly not open it up for non-residents until no. all this is resolved. Like I would delay that. Uh, you know, we've got residents who are saying they woke up at 5:30 in the morning and their kids don't have the you know, the recreation program of their choice. Um, and so I hope all these issues are going to be. Um, there's going to be some dispute resolution to it. And you know, do we not have, I hate seeing kids turned away for, for, for kids' sports. Um, is there no capacity to have surge, you know, a surge level if there's a certain area that's really popular that we could get some additional staffing, even if it's at a premium? We, uh, through the mayor, that's something we're certainly looking at. We have uh, job fairs that we just had recently. Um, we are somewhat challenged by getting staff in that have the qualifications and training to be able to deliver the programs right away. But uh, maybe I'll have our director of recreation weigh in if there's anything additional. And then, how do we, yeah, how do we get you. more staff? Uh, it is a, uh, a question that we are struggling with. We are doing uh, direct job fairs for specific areas as well. Uh, so we are uh, reaching out to our contacts at the school boards and other um, community serving uh, agencies as well to get uh, staffing levels up. Uh, to your question on the non-resident, uh, we will hold it even further. So it is a 14-day uh, delay for non-resident access to programs. Uh, so we're going to hold that for uh, a little bit further until we get this resolved. Okay. I, 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 sorry, I've sort of gone down a sidetrack of uh, back to community uh, services. Uh, but Councillor Keenan just made a good point too. Um, are all the programs now full? Uh, so I have the latest uh, through the chair. So I've got the latest numbers are we're just over 19,000 uh, registrations. Uh, so we're at uh, close to capacity in uh, skating and swim. So around 87 to 89% uh, fill rates already. Uh, so we are getting there uh, with other programs, uh, specialty programs, we do have capacity still. So what programs have capacity? Uh, camps, STEM programming, um, I'm just going through here, dance program, general interest programs, um, with some in STEM and special uh, sports too as well. So some drop-ins for sports as well. So we do have some capacity, but the swim and skate is where um, most of the uh, resident inquiries have come in from uh, because we do have limited and those are areas that we do have to have specialty staff. So, and then a few months ago, I received an email from a City of Brampton employee, I think I forwarded it to you at the time, saying that um, other cities were paying more for recreation staff. Um, are, are we competitive um, for recreation staff? Is there an issue here about why we're having, struggling to have adequate staff levels in recreation? So through, through the chair, um, there has been a review for the part-time wages. And so uh, there is a budget um, line item. And I, may, I may be speaking out of line here, but uh, there is a, a budget line item for part-time staff to be, um, I'm going to say, corrected. Uh, so to be brought up to where we should be. Uh, the instance that you're referring to was in a specialty area in personal training. So we've went back to our partners in HR to see if we can uh, line that up even further. Uh, so from a staffing perspective, it's uh, it, wages do play into it, but I wouldn't say that's the uh, end all and be all as far as the factors. It's just 
Uh, we've seen this across the industry with my counterparts in other municipalities as well. Uh, staffing has been a huge uh, challenge for, for all across every industry. Okay, and then uh, Councillor Pleshi just mentioned uh, something to me about swimming. Um, and, you know, swimming is a, a, a life skill. Every year we hear some tragic examples of a, a drowning in our community. I think that's a critical life skill that any child that wants to learn to swim, we want to make sure they can. Um, are we at 100% capacity in, in, in the swim programs? Uh, swim is just at 80, 87, 88% right now. Okay, so uh, we've so got we, some capacity we, there. Yeah, we will be there by the by the time that we get through all of our wait lists and, and manage um, individuals and, and offer up off opportunities at other centers. We'd be uh, very close to, if not uh, at 95%. Excellent. Okay, uh, Councillor Santos, followed by Councillor Pelosi. Thank you, through you, um, Mr. Chair, and I, I agree that we do need to find a, a solution to the issues with registration. So um, hopefully in the next registration process we could find a better way so we don't get backlogged again. Um, but to the point on the staffing shortages, I remember this conversation from the previous term of council when uh, all the COVID restrictions were, were lifted. Part of the reason why um, we have so, so much demand for swimming and skating, swimming in particular, um, is because it's a life-saving skill to have. And the city of Brampton actually offers it at a very competitive rate relative to some of the private organizations and other municipalities. Um, that being said, we have a lifeguard shortage. We have a staffing shortage related to instructors, um, both skating as well as in swimming. And so until we can actually address the staffing shortages, it's gonna be really difficult to increase programming for swimming if there are no teachers and if there are no lifeguards um, to help with, with some of these programs. So on top of finding the solution to improving the registration um, experience for our residents, I think we also need to look at how we attract more of that talent to the city of Brampton um, and what that means if it is Anand and, and I guess Bill, if it is actually, and, and Rick, if it is actually wages that, that is the issue for getting more staff or if it's just across the board that many of these young people who when I was a teenager or at that age would drop to, to get a job like this, um, I think that many of them just want to work from home, perhaps, <laughs> and not choosing the same career path and choices that we had when we were growing up. So I'd like to know what, what's happening there, because Anand, as you said, it's an issue across all municipalities, correct? Through the chair, that's correct. And, and one piece that we are leading as a municipality is that we're uh, removing some of the barriers for individuals to get aquatic certification. So uh, we as an operating department have decided to eat the cost of um, certif certification and um, not having the end user pay for that. So a lot of my uh, counterparts in other municipalities have uh, asked them how we're, how we're doing that and retaining staff. And so it has been successful, but it is a longer play um, with aquatic specifically once uh, an individual is in as a, as a lifeguard, they move through the ranks. Uh, the two years of COVID as, of us having shut yeah. down we lost that cohort, and so now we're trying to rebuild that. Um, but the city as, as a whole uh, is a leader as far as trying to attract talent and retain. So we've done a good job at um, removing some of the barriers that, that were in place um, for, for quite some time. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like, and, and thank you for summarizing that. So um, I'm happy to, I guess, at a future date, look at and focus on it as, as chair of community services to kind of push um, kind of uh, recruitment of some of these roles so that we can offer more uh, of these programs that are in higher demand. Um, but I think it, it's a it's a longer term problem that we have to look at and not necessarily just because of increasing budget. I think it, we have a bigger problem on our hands. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, through, Mr. Chair, if I could just say, we will we have committed to and we will bring back uh, a strategy on, on recruiting for those uh, positions. We're working, HR has, has already started this work uh, and uh, we will bring a report back. Uh, Councillor Pelosi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, uh, kind of. <laughs> um, Rick, 
the glitch is no doubt, you know, uh, the IT technical problem. And I heard from residents too. It was, it was a huge miss, a huge uh, upset for for a lot of residents. And and I don't know what we need to do to ensure that something like that doesn't happen again. But I'm sure that you know I'm I have all faith and confidence that you guys are are looking into it and, and you're going to make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. Three, Mr. Chair, we will take full accountability for that, yes. The other thing is a um, couple members of council decided that it would be a good idea last term to not allow certain levels of uh, 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 staff or councillors to have their, um, their kids hired by the city. Um, I think maybe it's time that we relook at that, given the labor shortage. I had my daughter, who's dying for a job, um, let me know that Jim Archdeacon was putting on a, uh, a job fair for the city of Brampton. She was so excited, and I told her she couldn't apply. Yeah. Three, Mr. Chair, we will be reviewing those policies as part of the report back to council on strategies to attract uh, talent to, to the organization. Yeah. So you will see recommendations come from us on that. I kind of think enough is enough, and and you know, I have a, I have a child that's of age to start working, and you know she can go and start working in the rec center or do whatever if 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 that helps. Like there's, I know there's countless number of staff that live in the city of Brampton um, that have kids, or just outside the city of Brampton, Denise, that have kids that can that are of age to 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 work, and and that's the way it used to be. You know, back 10, 20 years ago, you know, my sister worked, well, she was a lifeguard. And at that time, you know, not a lot of people wanted to be lifeguards, but, you know, she was, she was able to do that. And I think we need to be able to look at ways that, that, you know, we can, we can do the same. It's not, you know, it's not putting them above or, or outside of the process or, or, you know, the way it looks. Unfortunately, if, you know, I'm, I'm sure that, um, uh, you know, my daughter, if she was to work in, in Parks and Rec, maybe she'd be treated differently, but I don't know how I can, how I can change that. Ultimately, I think it's the best way for, uh, for the city if, the, if we're not providing the level of service to, to, to the residents. And if my daughter or my child or um, Councilor Keenan's kids are too young. Councilor Fourteen kids already work here. Theodore's not working. Um, Councilor Vincente, Councilor, yeah. I think, you know, I think it's definitely a benefit to the residents. So I think we need to change that. So whenever I can put that forward to to overchange that, maybe I'll, I won't add it to council this week, but. We appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to bring that back. Yeah. We do. If you can actually just let me know, I think it's, I don't know if it's managers and up or directors and up and or, or what. If you could just come back with me on that so I can reverse it. Or just Certainly. bring the motion and I'll, I'll overturn the motion. Certainly. We'll, we'll bring it, to, I believe, as part of an overall review of the uh, talent acquisition strategy uh, for, for, those, for those areas. Mm -hmm. And Thank let's you. just start off with, you know, community services only. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so a counselor... Parks um, and Recreation only. So I think Councillor Fleshy makes a very uh, valid point. You know, this council um, passed uh, at one of the, I guess, highest standards of an anti-nepotism uh, position uh, of four cities, and maybe uh, it is too broad in the sense that it includes e youth summer student positions where we have shortages. I think the intent um, to, to have a high standard in the city is the right one. Uh, but I think Councillor Pleshi makes a, a, a point. If, we've, if we we can't find staff, and you've got staff re ready to be a lifeguard or fill the service, there needs to be some reasonableness um, to that, uh, without diluting the overall intent to to have a high standard. We will endeavor to bring a report back, Mr. Mayor, uh, by early April. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions, so thank you, uh, Rick. Our next item is planning, building, and growth management. Steve Ganesh, you're on the hot seat. Yeah. 
Good uh, morning, Mayor Brown, members of council, uh, staff, those in the audience, and those who may be listening online. As the Commissioner of Planning, Building and Growth Management, it is my pleasure to present the proposed 2023 operating and capital budget for the department. And I guess I... Where's Adam? We might need him back on the line here. Uh, next slide. Who's controlling this slide? Ah, there we go. Yeah. Great. The uh, Planning, Building, and Growth Management Department consists of 264 staff committed to service quality excellence for our residents, businesses, and partners involved in the delivery of complete, connected, and vibrant communities to support the 2040 vision and Council's priorities and investments. Our focus is on providing a combination of strategic and operational deliverables, supporting building a foundation for our future. The proposed 2023 department budget was developed with four key goals in mind. The first is agility and innovation. I don't have to tell you that we are in interesting times in Brampton city building history, whether it be changes to the Planning Act, accelerated housing targets, or new ways of working with our partners, we have continued to respond quickly and take proactive measures to embrace these changes. As you know, in Brampton, we are fortunate to have a robust ecosystem of natural features, open spaces and trails in our city. To protect and steward these assets, our proposed budget supports environmental resiliency with investments in maintaining our stormwater assets and implementation of our environmental master plan. Brampton is at a turning point in its evolution. Over the next three decades, it is anticipated the city will grow to its boundaries. And during this time, Brampton will transition from a population of just over 680,000 to a large metropolis with a population of just over a million people. To embrace and prepare for this significant growth, a conservative effort must be made to ensure our communities are complete and connected. And lastly, delivery of many of services in our department is not possible without the support of our workforce that in turn will result in Brampton continuing to be one of Canada's best employers. Key drivers for the proposed budget are threefold. The first is recognizing our new era of growth. We continue to see confidence in the industry with an increase in development applications, which are also changing the housing landscape across our city. The majority of our housing stock is shifting from the traditional single family dwellings to apartments and townhomes. In 2022, we issued approximately just over $2 billion in construction value in building permits and we continue to see significant progress on our employment base with projects like the Electra Head Office, Lululemon, Magna, all leading to a healthy jobs to population ratio. The second reflects changes to the Planning Act that imposes new response times to development applications. Now, Council proactively addressed these changes in December of last year through adoption of an official plan amendment and implementing bylaw that improves our application intake process to support the reduction in red tape and have measurable outcomes in the processing time and customer service. And lastly, is continuing to deliver on council priorities, leveraging council's decisions on directing growth in strategic areas to enable the city building outcomes that we need. Last year, much like the past few, have been extremely busy for the department, which is a good sign because it underscores confidence in the industry to continue to invest in Brampton. This slide is a snapshot that tells the story of our 2022 performance and volume of development applications, again, the changing nature of our housing and employment, along with how we're meeting targets on the sustainability front. While we're seeing a slight decrease in application volumes year to date, it's most likely triggered by changes in the economy, escalating construction costs. However, 2023 is on track to be another busy year. The proposed 2023 budget, operating budget, addresses the aforementioned goals, drivers, and trends through a budgeted 50% increase in development application fees to realize the true cost of delivering our service, now subject to faster decision timelines imposed by the province. Council will recall in January of this year, there was a decision to phase in the increase starting with 25% with an exception to uh, Committee of Adjustment applications. And Council made the decision to increase pre-consultation fees from $644 to $5,000. 
On the environmental front, the proposed budget administers the $24 million of Bram the Brampton stormwater charge for 2023. And Councillor Pelleshi, to your question yesterday, of the $24 million, $10 million are on the residential side and $14.1 million are on the non-res side. There are administration uh, costs for the salaries, IT, billing and collections. And lastly, the proposed budget entails a modest request of 11 staff to support levels of, ser levels of service, improve customer service, and deliver key priorities. Of the 27 uh, positions requested in the 2022 budget, 18 have been filled, uh, six are actively uh, under recruitment, one has recently been vacated and will be under recruitment shortly. For the 2023 budget, the salary, wages, and benefits are related to the 275 staff, 11 of which are requested for 2023. Increases to the budget in labor and other expenses are offset by anticipated increases in revenue. The variance versus last year's budget includes, on the labor side, the 11 staff requests, plus negotiated wages for the current 264 staff. Administration expenses, such as professional and consulting fees, legal costs, advertising, and uh, building credit and debit charges due to greater online presence. And finally, the revenue generated by the increase in development application fees. On the capital side, the proposed 2023 budget accounts for continuous improvement efforts to expedite development approvals, forecasted to reduce our approval time by 25% after full implementation. Continuing to um, address climate change through adaptation actions such as stormwater retrofits, the Churchville flood remediation, environmental assessment, along with restoration of our stormwater system, which includes pond cleaning, water course erosion repairs, and maintenance of our uh, ditch and inspections. On the compensation work for endangered species, we're also investing in that through our city capital works program. With a focus on complete and connected communities, the proposed budget accounts for advancement of work on our major transit station areas, uh, continuing to advance our active transportation plan, and moving forward with secondary plans such as Heritage Heights, we're preparing to respond to the provincial direction on the Highway 413. Key projects for each of the divisions include in city planning and design, completion of the Bram West Parkway secondary plan, Delivery of our growth tracking model and completion of Brampton plan, our official plan, to, to comply with Bill 23. On de development services, we'll be advancing our develop, uh, business intelligence program to adhere to Bill 109. In downtown revitalization, we'll focus on the delivery of key projects associated with streetscaping efforts on Queen Street and Main Street. In the environment and development uh, engineering section, we'll continue to drive the Riverwalk program through planning, design, and construction. And our transportation team will deliver on the active transportation master plan through projects such as the uh, Chinkuzi Road improvements. This brings me to the end of my presentation. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my entire department for their efforts in this budget, staff and finance for their tireless efforts in supporting me and my team, and my CLT colleagues. Uh, my team and I are here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, the mayor just stepped up for a moment, so I'll chair for the meanwhile. Councillor Pleshi. Um, <clears throat> thank you for, uh, for getting the number, Steve. The 10 million res, 14 million non res. Um, stormwater management ponds have been uh, a thorn in my side for, for a while now, and I think that. A direction has been provided for us to look at, you know, alternative ways that we can um, that we can change storm the stormwater system. I think in Brampton, for us to have the most stormwater ponds, uh, more than any other municipality in Canada, is time for us to lead the way to say, you know, what what else can we do? So, um, I'd love to be a part of that and see um, see how we can make that change. Uh, I don't necessarily have any questions. Um, what I do say to you, Steve, uh, is since you since you came on, we tasked you to, to for a number of things that um, uh, in in the planning department, and you know, asking you to um, 
and your team to reduce the wait time of applications down to 50% and you automatically coming and saying, I have a great plan to reduce it to 25% just like that right off the bat was, was unbelievable. I think you and, and your team are doing a fantastic job. Um, with that being said, um, I know that it's tough out in the private sector where, you know, they're private sector and other municipalities are constantly poaching from us specifically because we have the best. So um, whatever we can do to, to try and, you know, retain who we have and, uh, and, and get the, the word out that, you know, Brampton's certainly open for business because of the, you know, great things that we're doing here and using maybe Bill 23 as a, as a springboard uh, for that. And so I just wanted to commend you and your, and your team on, uh, on some fantastic work. Sure, if I may, uh, th through the chair, thank you. I'm humbled to, to accept those comments, but those comments are reflected in the 264 staff that uh, support me and the entire organization, and hopefully through uh, Council's approval of my ask, it'll be 275 staff. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Plessy. Thank you, Steve. And with that, then we'll move on to our next department, which is Legislative Services. Welcome, Paul. Which one is the hit answer? Mr. Chair, I uh, first want to start by saying uh, thank you to Council for this opportunity to stand before you today. I want to thank uh, our QP representatives, although they may not be here today, we work very closely with Fab uh, and Ryan. Oh, I'm sorry, they've moved positions. Uh, I want to thank our Chair and Co-Chair of Legislative Services uh, uh, for the uh, support they've given us throughout the, uh, the year. Also to the uh, staff, our staff within legislative services, very dedicated commitment staff, committed staff. So thank you very much and no, no less to the uh, finance department, Alicia and company for helping us out with this. So I'll start by telling you, ref refreshing you on, I'm oh, sorry. Our, divi our division is made up of animal services, city clerk's office, court administration, Enforcement and bylaw services, insurance risk uh, management, legal uh, services, and realty. So it's a, a really eclectic group of uh, uh, operating divisions. And uh, we are here to support the city as a whole and other operating departments, moreover, than we are a front facing uh, organization. I can tell you for our budget goals, we remain uh, very centric to public safety within the uh, organization for the city. We would like to pro provide a timely strategic support and we also like to enhance our service delivery and continuous improvement and specifically doing that through training and technology. City growth has impacted all divisions and legislative services is no exception. We continue uh, to enhance uh, support for legal services, and this we believe will be the most cost-effective way to assist planning and adjusting to this new legislation regimes, especially Bill 177, 109, and 23. Provincial downloading as of March 10th for the part threes will be transitioning to the uh, prosecution office, and we expect a heavy caseload from that. And our response will have to be uh, measured in staffing and probably technology. Legislative services supports all the council priorities and our lens is specifically on opportunities, mosaic, being a green city, healthy and safe and well-run city. So we cross the spectrum. Growth has led uh, to an increase in demand for front-facing services, including bylaw enforcement, which is parking and non-parking and property standards and marriage and uh, licenses and ceremonies it has now been a very, very uh, uptick for us. The modernization of court administration will allow us for an increased uh, volume of prosecutions expected with the introduction of the administrative monetary penalty system for non-parking offenses and automatic speed enforcement infractions. 
and we are currently working on our ability to increase our dealing with tickets uh, disputed by disputed tickets by leveraging processes including technology and ultimately simplifying the process for residents. Our 2023 operating highlights. Information and data governance is uh, key and strategic to us, and it's designed to manage the availability, usability, integrity, and security of information and data stored in city systems. The strategy will allow the city to better understand what information assets the city has and how we leverage the value from that information and the data assets while meeting the growth to growing challenges of privacy, security, and governance. The strategy will allow for security control and optimization of information and data. Enforcement and bylaw services enhancements, including the following, uh, following examples of uh, a quote for a second LPR, I talked about it yesterday, license plate reader. Creating or in leveraging our tow module within GTECNA, which we haven't done before. And that would be a pilot project. We are a leader in GTECNA enforcement. Tablets for field inspections, which increases our efficiencies and expanding of our mobile printer and vehicles. And this allows us to, to allow the officers to do their function out in the field as opposed to in the office. And we are trying to keep the officers on target, on ground as much as we can. We'll continue to examine processes and staffing models. And as an example, we've made changes to our court administration to help streamline the prosecution of bylaw offenses. We will continue to be expanding the AMP uh, system with the addition of ASC and other non-parking offenses. And this expansion is expected to more than offset the, the ramp up costs. Councillor Pelleschi, in answer to one of your questions from the other day, uh, fuel efficiency. So when we look at greener, we uh, used approximately a quarter million dollars in fuel last year uh, for enforcement, and we used approximately $62,000 in fuel for animal services. We're working very closely with Public Works on greening our fleet and trying to electrify it as much as we can, and we're going to be one of the first examples to roll out with that. Our planning applications has increased, as Steve has talked uh, to you about, and the development applications are expected to increase substantially in 2023 and beyond uh, those years due to Bill 109 and 23. We expect a response from our legal uh, capacity to stop going out as much as we can outside legal and use internal legal to assist Steve and his, and his uh, department in uh, responding to these applications. Residents can now apply for a marriage license online never before. Previously, the city only offered and accepted paper-based applications, and upon completing the online license application, the application will be received and given a reference number, which is required when they attend City Hall. So we're improving our efficiencies there. This new process is explained using social media, including an Instagram reel and a TikTok video. And Peter can tell you, the uptick in marriage license is significant. We, are, we should be the flower city and marriage city. It's just the way it's coming out. But, um, and in our response, we have to be, we have to be understanding of that. Um, one example is we use a very small office to do a lot of ceremonies. We have to, we have to not glorify, but we certainly have to do the respect to the marriage ceremonies. And we're looking to expand our capabilities by expanding our facilities for that. Additional uh, 2023 operating highlights. The increased volume of prosecutions related to provincial downloading of Part 3s, increase in parking fractions, and changes to the AMP process for non-parking violations necessi necessitated the modernization of the court administration. This included uh, an addition of one full-time FE, which FTE, which was approved in 222, and that was the only outstanding one for us. There has been an extensive growth, growth in the amount of planning applications in the City of Brampton. City hiring of a lawyer with uh, hearing experience will reduce the amount of external counsel retained, which will save the corporation an extensive, extensive amount of the external legal costs, in addition to helping to preserve the planning department's ability to collect application fees. In addition to Bill 109, there have been several policy initiatives uh, within the City of Brampton, including inclusionary zoning, 
affordable housing and a newly required parks plan and bylaw community benefits charges. In addition to ongoing advice uh, with respect to the implementation of these initiatives, Legal Services expects appeals or challenges of some or all of these initiatives, which will be a substantial considerable amount of work, and that's why we're looking to hire in-house expertise. Summer students. Presently, we have six summer students that do uh, weeds and uh, long grass and rubbish. We're looking to expand that to 10 summer students so we can respond more quickly to the city's uh, uh, complaints. In addition to that, we're changing processes that they use. They used to go, the students used to go out to the, uh, to the complaint address, take the information, come back, go to the office, do their work, do the charges, et cetera. We're now going to get technology to put in their hands so we can do those right at scene where they can issue the, uh, the fines or the warnings right there. So we're looking at all processes to become more efficient. Uh, the operating budget overview. Of significance is we're $38.1 million. Of that 31.1, majority is uh, salary and wages, as you see, 79%, which is in line with usually the federal standards of between 80 and 85%. But on the other side, you'll see that our user fees and service charges account for 68% return. On. So we are only a property tax funded by 32%. And we're going to be getting better as years go on with the fines and the uh, the revenues we will collect. Capital highlights, enforcement and bylaw services plan to uh, add an additional AELPR uh, reader uh, to assist in park enforcement. An enterprise risk management system is needed for our risk management division. Uh, we would require that to do a better correlation of data and understanding what our claims are and how we respond to those claims. City growth, um, considering city growth, a corporate-wide uh, scan of charges, enhancements to programs and services such as the TOCPs, Realty Services will develop a strategy for long-term city land acquisitions, as well as the modernization of tools and processes for managing our, our holdings, our land holdings. Then we have the design of the new animal shelter, which is expected to be complete in 223, with hopefully building in subsequent years, 224 and on. However, the project, uh, but the project is presently funded adequately, and we're hoping to stay that way. Our last slide is our capital over uh, budget overview, and you can see that uh, we're really we're not capital heavy. We're an 8.8 million dollar capital fund. The majority of it is in real estate for our real estate holding leases that we pay off, et cetera, et cetera. And then $40,000 for enforcement, uh, enforcement bylaw services. And that's a miscellaneous account we use for technology purchases, uh, uh, replacement uh, function, and it'll be used for the LPR. Uh, and in addition to that, then you'll see um, insurance risk management is $200,000 for our uh, proposed risk management uh, software. So at this point, uh, my presentation is concluded and I'm here for questions. Okay, Councillor Pelosi. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, thanks, Paul. Paul, I'm going to, First, I'm going to talk about the animal shelter, and then um, that's kind of all the questions that I had related to the actual budget, but I have something else to ask. Uh, the animal shelter, um, I know it's much needed, and uh, and I look forward to uh, that report to come back and, and for us to, you know, put this shelter out by on the Siemens land. I think it makes sense out there with all the growth that's um, that's happening. I think it's a good good opportunity for, for it to go there. But at some point, I'm going to tie that animal shelter to the Environmental Education Center because as far as I'm concerned, the Environmental Education Center isn't moving fast enough. Um, I know we had an MOU with CVC. We're now dissolving that MOU, and I'm going to join this shelter to the uh, uh, education centers to make sure that you know, we can get both, both built at the, at the same time. Um, and I think there's definitely some synergies there bringing sure. kids in and having them learn about um, um, our programs and services through animal services is, is definitely a benefit for residents, I think. Sure, there may be economies of scale as well when we put the bills. Yeah. Um, 
As for, <clears throat> so my other comments are um, are kind of about time, and we don't, you know, we don't measure time in, in dollars, but we're in the kind of business of trying to hurry everything up and move it along, so essentially for a lot of it, time is money. Um, and when I, so the majority of, of, you know, the issues that are coming in, whether they're relevant to uh, uh, residents' issues or or uh, the private sector businesses or, or development, um, I get a lot back when, when I've asked questions or, or asked for the status on things and it's, it's in legal and it tends to um, go to legal and, and, and sit in legal for, for a long time. And I understand legal has to do their due diligence and, and everything like that, but um, it's frustrating. It's so frustrating when, um, when these things are, are, I feel like sometimes that uh, legal services is the, uh, is the tail that wags the dog. And, um, you know, if I get, I know it's hard sometimes for, uh, for people to, to make decisions. And I think that, you know, we're a corporation that we need to be able to empower all employees um, to make decisions. And if you make the wrong decision, that's okay. We'll learn from that and we'll move on. But I think it's important that we at every level empower our employees to, to make decisions. And I think for a lot of it, we, you know, we move a lot of stuff to legal services to, to make those decisions when we can make them, um, make them ourselves. And I can specifically go to probably each department and, and give an example. But so that being said, time is money. And I f find that, you know, um, they're not the decision makers, and and I think that they need to know that um, you know things that come in they have to get them out as fast as possible. And if there's anybody in the corporation that has to move uh, faster than anybody else, it's legal services. Risk, risk is um, you know I think it's fairly new when I was coming into the private sector a long long time ago. You know we never really talked too much about about risk and then all of a sudden it got more and more um, airtime and then everything kind of started going to, well, what's the risk on this and identifiers and plans and and I, I, I just find that eventually, like the risk is, is, is the risk. I don't think it changes too much, um, especially when we're in a very repetitive business. Um, but I think that's, again, something else that's, um, that's keeping public sector uh, from operating like private, where we, um, you know, when a when a private organization wants to build a, a, a soccer field, they can do it for significantly cheaper than than we can. And I always blame risk for that. Well, and you're quite right through you, Mr. Chair. Risk risk can sometimes be that, and that's why we're asking for the uh, enterprise risk management system so we can create a meat chart for that. So instead of sending our, our questions to risk and letting them ponder that and come back with an example, they can just simply go to previous history, mm -hmm. previous actions, come out of that with an answer fairly quickly to us and say, okay, this really fits in this silo and, and we're gonna say, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at, at processes to, to make that more expedient. I quite understand it. Okay. In the budget, it has, I'm gonna try and go off memory because I couldn't find it again. I think it's nine point four dollars per per thousand that is spent on any particular uh, any particular item that um, or legal proceeding or legal uh, item within the city of Brampton. But what I what I don't and what I found confusing of, of that particular page in the budget um, was it didn't tell me, you know, overall, what is the, the amounts that um, 
that I guess we're being sued for or the amount of damages, the potential damages. I couldn't, even with that number, I couldn't, I couldn't, I don't understand enough of it to say that that's good or that's bad. Yeah, through you, Mr. That, that's really, you've hit upon a point that, once again, the ERM will help us with. It's hard to determine those numbers because they fluctuate. Sometimes we have outstanding claims that have been going for 10 years and we haven't settled them yet, so they'll come into play. Sometimes we have complaints or settlements where we pay over a period of time or we pay in a different format to, to another third party. So a lot of those numbers are hard to to get a final ratio number and once again I fall back and that's what we we clearly need an ERM clearly need that to help us discern what those numbers are so you're quite right it is a confusing number I, I could turn to finance to see if uh, nope where's Alicia uh, yeah do we have a there you are do we, do we have a better answer for that no. Okay. I gave okay. you the best answer I could, sir. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I'll move to, I'm kind of expanding on what I said I wasn't going to get into, but um, so the amount of dollars that are put out um, that, um, uh, what is it called when we settle? Um, how do we determine, I guess what I want to know is, do we automatic, autom automatically settle for somebody tripping over a, a, a loose piece of concrete in the, on a sidewalk or, or uh, hitting a pothole and blowing a tire? How do we determine what, what kind of, because again, going back to yeah. a lot of re repeat, like I'm sure we have hundreds of people that have tripped on a sidewalk, so. So through you, Mr. Chair, I can tell you, some of it is standardization and if we feel that we're not that, that we are culpable for some sort of event then we'll, then we'll we'll have a standardization number to it lots of times we'll evaluate and see where the responsibility the onus is we may be 50 percent responsible maybe 70 percent responsible so we'll delve into those those aspects and determine that mm -hmm. um and you're right uh, that's another hard area risk has has challenged us with uh, but we don't arbitrarily across the board just say we have a standard number we're going to give to everybody we we do look to to only paying for what is our responsibility to pay i think in the future and maybe uh you i and uh and chair santos can sit down and have a discussion on um on the settlements in the city and um and try and get a handle on where we are yeah, absolutely. absolutely. We would love to do that. We tried to, to get a really good grasp on it a couple of years ago, but it took volumes and volumes of paper to uh, to understand. But we'll try, we'll put it on the table, we'll give you the, the information, and we'll see where we can go with it. Okay. I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Councillor Santos. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Paul, for the uh, the presentation. Um, just uh, piggybacking off of Councillor Pileschi's issues regarding to delays and time is money with respect to legal, um, but this is not news to you. Um, I have issues with risk, the, the risk team in that sometimes, um, and I've shared this publicly and also with you before, there are more barriers and delays with respect to as, you know, risk factors as to why we can't do things and then there's a battle as to why not and then time is wasted and then at the end of the day we end up moving forward with the project and so um, are we now in a situation um, whereby we're looking at risk a little bit differently not necessarily creating a barrier for things to happen in the city and wasting delaying time but us actually looking at risk and how to find solutions to move forward um. Absolutely, I, I hear what you're saying, and yes, we are. We'd like to do that. Um, we plan to to dovetail the, that with the hiring of a new risk manager. And we've had an active manager, and he's done a wonderful job. Considering we've asked, we thrust him into the position for uh, for a long period of time, and then we went short behind him. So mm -hmm. he's done an admirable job there. But doing that, taking the risk management uh, piece, 
we'll certainly look at uh, how we're going to do this in a more expedient manner. It's really, a lot of it comes down to is we never really want to set a bad precedent. So risk is always looked at it so we don't have to do that. Right. But as Councillor Pelleshi has pointed out, we have to take some courage here and start moving yeah. forward. Yeah, for sure. And, and I thank you for bringing that up in terms of setting precedent. So, for example, I had an, an experience where we were looking at um, electric bikes. Um, and now we're doing now electric scooters. And I know that there were some huge issues re related to risk on that one. Finally got through it. But um, we were testing electric bikes. And somebody from risk came to join us for that. Pulled up in a beautiful sports car. Nice sports car. But um, I tested the bike. And it was a really pleasant experience. And at the end of it, I, I had asked, so what do you think? Can we make this happen? And the, whole, the response was just like, I don't know, there's too much risk and blah, blah, blah. And, and I shared, I'm like, they're doing this bike program in Toronto, in Montreal, in Hamilton. There's precedent. Why is it that Brampton is just so slow in implementing these new programs that other municipalities are already doing? Um, so I shared that as an example because you, we have a progressive council. We have a young council wanting to try new things. We're a growing city, one of the youngest cities. And I think we need to implement some of these projects a lot, a lot faster. And sometimes risk is just in, in the way in creating barriers and excuses not to do them. I take that into consideration. Yeah. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you. The other question I have is just, um, so uh, Tracy Pepe came in yesterday to talk about property standards. We brought forward a few motions early in the term about property standards, proactive by law enforcement. Um, just an update on when those reports are coming forward with respect to property standards and the blitzes that we're looking at, licensing landlords, code of conduct. Okay, I'm going to turn to JP to let you uh, hear from him because he's directly working on that, if that's okay with you. Sure. Good morning. Um, <laughs> uh, through the chair, we are at the final stage of our report. We are aiming and tracking for March 29th for the community council to bring the report forward. Uh, we'll have some recommendations, and what we've tried, we've we've done a pilot project for the last four weeks or so, mm -hmm. specifically for proactive property standards enforcement strategy, and we'll be bringing that forward uh, on the 29th. So. Okay, great, thank you. And, and then my um, next question, just uh, for residents so that I can share with them as well. With respect to bylaw enforcement, what are your top issues that you deal with mostly, like in terms of where, where you allocate your, your uh, bylaw officers? Well, there's, in, in the entire division, through the chair, the entire division, we, parking is certainly the number one when it comes to the number of complaints. Uh, we received uh, a, a lot of complaints for parking, and it's an ongoing issue. Um, second would most likely be in the property standards uh, area that we were dealing with uh, uh, as a number, number two uh, okay, complaint. Okay, perfect. Those are all my questions. Thanks. Councillor Vasante. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Paul? When you look at your revenue side and you talk about how you, your revenue comprises mainly of your fines, is there an opportunity for us to uh, achieve uh, greater compliance, more behavioral change if we increase fines for specific infractions? There's always that opportunity, but it has to be coupled with your ability to enforce that. So the increased fines are one thing, yeah, a person gets a ticket, but if you don't hand out a lot of those tickets, it really has no impact. So you have to do the increased fines coupled with the increased ability to enforce. All right. Is there an opportunity uh, going forward for us to review fines and see whether or not we may want to increase them in order to get the kind of change in behavior that we would like to see? There's always that opportunity. It all depends what fines you're looking at. The administrative monetary penalties are, are really supposed to be not punitive. They're supposed to be more um, an awareness and an education fine, where we do have other 
other fines where we can increase uh, increase those, and we have the ability to do that. We try to stay in step with what the what the communities across uh, Ontario are in and around. We try not to be outlandishly high. I mean. Um, and we, we don't want to be too soft as well. So we try to sort of stay in that sweet spot, the middle, the, the top 40% of, of fines, um, to be realistic. We understand and recognize it's a really, it's a big hardship for some people to, to take a fine of, say, a $500 fine for a handicapped parking. Uh, I mean, some people work a week to get that money. So we've got to find uh, ways to, to, to impact them, but, but not handcuff them or, or, or put them at peril. Thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, I get a lot of, have a lot of conversation with residents on this issue, and you know, both myself and Councillor Santos deal with, for example, you talk about parking as the number one issue. Um, there certainly is, um, with respect to residents who talk to us, there would be an appetite from them and I wonder if we would have the appetite to have you review fines specifically, for example, for parking infractions in neighborhoods, which are um, a pesky problem. Well, and, we, and, you know, could we look at that and see what we can do in order to make sure that when someone does receive a fine, they get the message? We, we can certainly do that. We were talking about this last night, and one of the impacts of that is the, is the payment of the fines. So, well, although we do handle lots of fines, we do not get a lot of fines, uh, in parking especially, we do not get a significant amount of that money back from the issuance of the ticket. So we're looking at ways to do that. Uh, the provincial government did not help us out with the change on the license plate uh, registration with the val tags. So people now, they don't have to register. They just renew their, their uh, online permit, they don't get a valid tank sticker, et cetera. That was one of our biggest allies in recovery of fines. Provincial government took that away. It really, really put us at, uh, at a uh, bad position. And so we'll have to look at more creative ways to, you know, issuing the fine is one thing, collecting the fine is a completely different matter. Okay, thank you. I just think that that's something we should definitely be looking at. And we can do that. Thanks. Councillor Fertini. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, going back to those infractions on property standards. Yes, sir. Over and over and over. Are we going to make changes on those when it's the same homes that we have to keep, keep going? So through you, Mr. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, JP had mentioned that we started a pilot project, and now we're looking at any, any property that we feel is a habitual uh, problem. Uh, we are now targeting that property. We're going back and we're upping our enforcement efforts. We're upping the, our, uh, the impact on the homeowner. So we're now, we're certainly changing the way we used to do yeah, this. Yeah, waiting for courts and so keep going back and forth. You know, it's just delaying and occupying more time in the court. I think, you know, we got to start just finding them. You go once or twice and the, the file gets closed and it reopens again. And it's always the same people. They know the system. So I think, you know, once we go after the third or fourth time, we just lay a big fine. And the other thing is on the parking. You know, it was funny that the other day I was driving by. We had that last storm. There's cars parked and the plows go by. And this morning I was on the same street and the garbage truck couldn't go by because cars are there on both sides. And the plow had to back up. And he can't really back up unless he got someone. These vehicles parked on both sides of the street, and you could see it was there. The plow went around the last storm. He moves up ahead more. Now, you know what happens with a plow, Rob? When it goes this way, it's pushing all the snow two houses over. The guy's saying, I can't get out because of the snow's there. Like, are we going to tow these vehicles when they're winter time? You're Especially absolutely. if they're one side. They're on both sides. Yeah. No, through you, Mr. Chair, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. One, of our, one of our hindrances for that is our ability to get tows. So as soon as the storm hits, we're not the only, unfortunately, we're not the only person who really wants a tow. Mm -hmm. So we get backlogged and we'll, we'll ask for tows. And sometimes we're hours or days from getting a tow for a, a vehicle. Mm -hmm. And we've changed contractors for that. That hasn't remedied, remedied yet. Um, we were sort of at a wit's end. I think we did, over the last five years, we've done 1,081 tows, I think. Somewhere in that ballpark, pretty yeah. close. And we fight tooth and nail to get those. And it's not an impact and cost to us. We'll tow because we don't pay. 
Yeah. It's the citizen who pays completely the price of the tow. Absolutely. So we're not we're not prohibited by that. We're not saying, oh, you know, we don't have it in our budget to tow. Mm. We don't have it in our capacity to get a tow. Mm. That's the tough part uh, for it's us. So Otherwise, we would tow much more. And it's fortunately that the garbage truck could get by this morning. You no, know, and you're quite right. Both sides and the guy standing there, he's honking and he's honking and he's honking, and, you know. And finally, the lady came up from the other side, but you could see those three cars are always on the same spot as the snow goes by. The other and thing is... Can I talk back? So I know it won't remedy it, but if you can give us the address for that, we'll yeah. be happy to The other up. thing is, on those cars, even if we... I understand on the towing. The yards are full, they're busy, it's accidents, all the tow trucks are busy. To Councilor Vincente said, so I get them a $30 ticket when it's like that, we could give them a $150 ticket. Because and we, they're really causing a problem because even the garbage truck couldn't get through this morning. We're, we're happy to do this. Yeah. We're happy to look at the, the, the yeah. dollars that we, we find people for. We just, as long as council's happy, because you'll get the complaints. Okay. You, you know, as soon as we hand out a ticket for a fine, the people line well, up at your doors to complain. Well, you know, you, you, when you stop in a garbage truck and snow plow, it's a problem. The other yeah. thing is, you talked about the plates and the thing. Even though you're online, if you have a parking ticket, 407, they won't give you, I know you don't get the sticker no more because I just bought another car and they just give you a plate and no sticker. But they look if you got tickets or anything. They won't give you the plates. Parking, uh, 407, yeah, you're quite right. People don't know. And parking too. They, they, are, they have their own system and they, their ability to manage it that way. We, unfortunately, we don't because when we give out a parking ticket, um, it, we automatically run the plate. And then we, once we run the plate, we know who the owner is. We used to take, if it doesn't get paid, then we go, we used to go to plate denial. Right. Well, now when we go to plate denial, we, uh, we yeah. haven't really seen anything. Uh, Lori, are you on the line? Well, the reason I'm asking, I, the car I got, I had to pay a $56 ticket. Who knows when I got the ticket? Never got in the mail. Yeah. And, you know, this, I had to give them the, or else they wouldn't give me the plate. And, that, so and that's my. It does register. I, I think you have to go to denial, or what you said. Play with denial, yeah. absolutely. So but we don't, we don't see a lot of that anymore with now with the ballot okay. tags the way they are. People just don't pay their tickets. Okay, but those repeat offenders, I know I got a lot of them in my area. Like, you know, we go by long. We keep talking about that, and they go over, they close the file. A month later, it's back again, especially summertime. It, it looks like a mess when they got barbecues and collecting scrap. And, like, they want to make the extra money, but you have a garage. Even the backyards are a mess. So, okay. I re and Thank I recognize you. that, and we'll try to help out where we can. Oh, sir. the other thing, one more question before. We talked about this before. When I, you get these parked cars, and when our bylaw, now that you're coming up with this new technology, give out a ticket. It should show if the vehicle is stolen or not. Those stolen vehicles are report. And I was with an officer yesterday in Marysboro. They have it in Toronto. So when they actually scan it, it shows that car is stolen. That, those cars I've seen over there, they had four parking tickets. Some of them were faded, and we just give them tickets, but nobody, it doesn't actually appear if it's stolen or not. So through you, Mr. Here, uh, Councillor Fertini, you're entirely correct. Some cities have arrangements with their police yes. services. Uh, the city of Brampton used to have an arrangement with their police service that we would be aware of what the stolen autos were. Uh, we ha don't have that. We haven't had it for a while. JP has, has tried to talk to Peel Police. Uh, we're still we're still in discussions for that. I don't know if we'll get it. It really surrounds itself by some, some obstacles as well. So it's the safety of our employees. So if we go and our employee knows it's a stolen auto, not everybody reacts the same way, and they might become hypersensitive to the fact that it's a stolen auto could have been used in any kind of offense. They get a little worried, etc. So some some cities have done silent hits. So with our new technology, if we drive our our automatic uh, plate reader down the street. It can take the license plate numbers, and then it'll silent hit back on the stolen auto sheet, so it'll notify Peel Police that there is a stolen auto there. Yeah. Okay. So there are ways to do it. We're in talks. Uh, hopefully, we'll make some headway. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, Councillor uh, Frattini, um, I don't see any other questions. So uh, thank you, uh, Paul. This takes us to the office of the CEO. Marlon, you're on deck. You move it. Okay, perfect. Good photo. Good morning, everyone. I will be presenting the 2023 budget for the office of the CEO. But first, 
I'd like to thank mayor and members of council for their support, our CLT team, our leadership team, and all staff in the organization uh, for preparing the, the budget and for the hard work that they do every day to move our, our organization uh, forward. And in that note, I'd like to acknowledge uh, QP. We got Fabio and Ryan with us here today. Welcome to our budget session. The CEOs, next slide, please. They see the CEO's office is accountable for ensuring council's decision and policy directions are effectively implemented to support the city strategic priorities. The office ensures that the city's programs and service, services comply with legislation and are fiscally responsible and meet the needs of our diverse community. The office of the CEO encompasses four main divisions. They are corporate projects and, and policy liaison, economic development, internal audit, and organizational performance and strategy. But before I get into some details of these uh, divisions, I just want to spotlight a few things that my office is also working on. Uh, they are the city's partnership with post-secondary institution, the city's requirement and responsibility to support the implementation of the More Homes Build Faster Act, Bill 23, as you all know, to reduce the red tape and increase housing supply, and the Better Municipal Governance Act, Bill 39, to assess regional and lower tier, lower tier responsibilities. In addition to that, I think we talked about it this morning, um, is attracting and retaining talent is another key um, key initiative being looked at. Next slide, please. In terms of the other four divisions, the CEO's office will be focused on delivering the following budget goals. Driving economic growth through business retention, expansion, attraction, and entrepreneurial initiatives. Continue to strengthen the innovation district in downtown Brampton by attracting activity through the Brampton Entrepreneur Center, Rogers Cybersecurity Catalyst, Brampton Venture Zone, Altitude Accelerator, uh, Founder Institute, and Brampton Beehive. Expand the fraud prevention and investigative capabilities, including fraud prevention uh, policy updates, and clarify fraud reporting and investigative processes improve the quality and independence of audit and investigative communications. Apply an equity lens to enhance equity, inclusion, diversity, and anti-racism at the city and in, in the community. Advance government advocacy and strategic priorities and secure grants, sponsorship, advertising opportunities to offset city operational cost and fund facility improvement and support community programming, develop and implement the corporate strategic framework, strategic plan, and service plans that are focused, realistic, and more important, achievable. Mature the city's project management process and capital compliance to improve project delivery and outcomes and, in, and reduce our backlog. Advance continuous improvement practices to create efficiencies Reduce costs, improve customer experience, review and enhance guidelines and policies for corporate legislative compliance and governance. Next slide. Our main budget drivers is the growth and maturity of the city as it continues to put pressure and demands on our services. We remain focused on supporting the directions and priorities set by council to deliver value for the public. We also face extraordinary inflationary pressures and increased costs in every area of our business. We are challenged by the need to evolve and keep pace with legislative changes such as Bill 23, Bill 39, etc. The economic growth of the city necessitates the need for additional support for services, initiatives, and innovative outcomes we have to start to think outside the box more. Market conditions, uh, the delays and challenges experienced in the market 
continues to put pressure on our operations and service delivery. We continue to find ways to create efficiencies, save costs, and improve our customer experience. Update and enhance city policies, procedures, and standards to reflect the sophistication of a mature municipality. And an expense specific to, to uh, one of our divisions is the impact on, on our budget is increased fuel and travel cost. And some of these budget drivers are reflected in our 2023 budget ask. Next slide, please. The CEO's office budget priorities are closely related to our immediate needs. We are looking to update, as I mentioned, the fraud prevention policy, improve independence and quality of audits, champion council priorities, and the work that will enhance equity and inclusion continue to build strategies and work planning in consultation with the equity deserving groups, broaden the scope of activities to build on the 2022 foreign direct investment strategy, develop and launch corporate service plans and corporate strategic plans, continue to advocate for external support and funding to advance city priorities, mature the organization project management and continuous improvement processes, review, evaluate, and refresh current youth employment and engagement initiatives. Next slide, please. We're operating budget overview. Majority of our 16.1 million is on salary, wages, and benefits, professional services, advertising, marketing, st staff development. But unique to our section is a 7% in contribution to reserves and capital related to the Brampton Venture Zone, and 2% in grants and subsidies and donations related to economic development initiatives. We are also requesting six full-time permanent uh, positions. Three of these positions are in the equity office, and they were approved last year by council. Their support, these positions are to support indigenous reconciliation project and the expansion of the equity office. The other three positions are for internal audit. Two are for the support of, of investing uh, in investigations stemming from the fraud hotline operations. And one is to strengthen independent communications and messaging of internal audit work. Next slide, please. Our capital highlights or our, our, our priorities in the budget are to continue progressing towards the opening of the uh, medical school in Brampton. There's some work to be done there in relocating our tenants. The Brampton Beehive scale up, champion Brampton as a national hub for cybersecurity, enhance the awareness and branding of the Brampton Innovation District, and broaden the scope and, in, and activities to build on a 2022 foreign direct investment uh, strategy. Next slide, please. Our capital budget slowly comprises economic, of economic development, which is only about 12% is funded from tax-based capital contribution, and 88% comes from other funding. And that's the end of my presentation, and I'm open to any questions. Councillor Plushy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thanks, Marlon. Can you um, can you give me a breakdown of the six new um, additions to your to your office? Yes, we've got three in the equity office. They were approved by council last year. And they how are, many are in? How many are in the equity office now? I we got Michelle here. Sorry, and that's what I kind of meant with breakdown. Four. There's four in total, so yes. there's three. Uh, three more four. coming, yes. Okay. And I can give you those, those titles. Advisor in Equity Office, a Program Coordinator, and a Senior Advisor for Indigenous Liaison. Okay. And then three more? Six in total? Uh, but these three would be seven. No, it would be six. You're right. Three, yep. Yeah. Those, those are the three. What are, where are the other three? The other three are, you have the titles? In the, yes. Okay. 
and we the, just recently hired going the, the indigenous audit. coordinator. Right, and then the other three, rounding out the six, are in audit? Well, the other three would be in audit, yes. yes. And, sorry, and how many currently in audit? We are supposed to have eight in terms of counting them, but we only have six because the other two are still counting because the other six departments were subject to what we have to cut. Sorry, you have to come down. Oh, come on. Uh, if it was going to be really easy, then we, then we have okay, eight. We have eight, uh, but two are seconded in other departments. Two have been taken out of out audit. Out of audit, and, and they're working in other, in other departments. So the reason that we, we have a hard time of hiring the two secondment is because the dates keep pushing forward, and we can't like manage a short-term hiring, because it's very hard to fill internal auditor because it's a very hard market. Yeah. And also, the salary level we've been talking to HR now, we are very, very below the salary level, both the range mm -hmm. and also we pay staff consistently at the minimum point, mm -hmm. where other cities pay them at the maximum point. So for instance, we've just uh, met with HR, with HR and they've determined our senior auditors are 18% paid below other people in terms of even the salary range and we consistently pay the minimum and they pay the highest. Okay. So there's a huge gap. And right you're now. fixing that in the budget? We, well, we didn't because we were struggling. We're doing like a one by one case. Malong and I have. Oh, right. Yes, we're yes, doing yes. it with HR, but it will be adjusted probably next year. Okay. Yeah. In 2022, how many asks and what was the complement of audit? In 2022. For the it's 2022 what I said. Budget. We have eight people. Eight we only people? have six. In 2023, we've asked for three additional people. We're hoping that the two positions that seconded will return to us in July. That's the current forecast. Okay. okay. So just slow. Sorry, slow down one second. Okay. Um, two were poached from another department. Yes. Yes. Okay. Which brought you down to six. You're a you're asking for three in this budget, but you still have those additional two, hoping that they'll come back. Yes. If they don't come back. You'll fill them. Yes. We'll so fill them. Yeah. with five. Yes. But two are from last budget. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And would you like us to explain what the three positions are? Um, For, no, we I this. already know that okay. because okay. I because uh, okay. Councillor Keenan told me. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, um, Marlon. In your budget, how much is associated with how much budget do you have for, for communications, and how much do you have for engagement? We've got $120,000 for uh, engagement and about $230,000 for communication. And engagement sorry, in- Sorry, 200 and- 230,000. 230. How much of that uh, communication or engagement is attributed to audit? I believe- uh, through you, uh, the chair, I believe about uh, twenty, about twenty thousand. About twenty thousand. Yes. Okay. Um, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Councillor Pelleschi. Any other questions? I uh, thank you, Marlon. Um. <coughs> Okay, so uh, we had the Brampton Library scheduled to come at 1 p.m. So why don't we recess uh, until uh, 1, and it gives everyone a chance to follow up on their questions uh, and uh, have a lunch break. So we need a motion to receive the uh, presentations this morning. Uh, moved by Councillor Keenan, second by Councillor Basante. Vicente. Uh, all those uh, in favor? Motion carried.
Okay, we are back in session for our budget deliberations. And um, as part of the budget deliberations today, we now have some presentations. And the first presentation is from Todd Kyle, CEO, and Michael Ben, board chair of the Brampton Public Library. Can you get a 10 minutes check, please? Just through you, Mr. Mayor, to members of the budget committee, there are five members present in chambers, uh, Mayor Brown, Deputy Mayor Singh, Councillor Power, Councillor Kaleshi, Councillor Santos, and online we see Councillor Tour, Councillor Brar, Councillor Vasante, and that is all I see at the moment. So we do have quorum, Mr. Chair. So, uh, uh, to, um, be, to Michael and Todd, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of Council. Uh, we are here to give a background to the Brampton Library's 2023 operating and capital budget request. And as uh, we have previously presented, the mission of the library is to build an inclusive community by inspiring learning, advocacy, <coughs> literacy, and social cohesion. Its vision of inspiring connections is articulated through its values, namely creativity, curiosity, <coughs> collaboration, community, and connection. Next slide, please. Um, the, yeah, one more, please. Thank you. The library's new strategic plan was recently launched with five strategic directions as presented here. And I would like to draw particular attention to the second one, which is to grow our capacity in response to community needs. It is essential that the library be provided with the resources to grow with the city. And this budget is a step in that direction. Next slide, please. The library's goals include offering no-cost access to a wide variety of resources, technology programs, services, and spaces, with particular attention paid to academic and career success. In order to do this, we are focusing on breaking the digital divide, growing our facilities, re-engaging customers after the pandemic, and leveraging our community partnerships. Next slide, please. The drivers of our budget request this year include increasing cost, population, and demand for space and online e-resources, in addition to the need to relocate our Chinkusi branch as it moves out of the civic center. I will now pass it over to our CEO, Todd Kyle. Thank you so much. Uh, next slide, please. So the uh, 2023 operating budget priorities are in line with the launch of our strategic plan, and these include the continuing expansion of our e-resources for learning and for creative services, the launch of a fundraising program focused on digital divide programs and uh, facility improvements, expanding the hours at our southwest branch to more closely uh, mimic those of the other branches, and continuing to deepen our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy. Next slide, please. Here you can see the breakdown of our expenditures on the left um, and on revenues on the right. So I think it's the next one. My apologies. There we go. I'd like to note uh, that despite the library community's advocacy, the Provincial Public Library operating grants remain frozen at the levels uh, from 1996. And so they are an ever decreasing proportion of our budgets. As you can see, of the $21.4 million proposed budget, $20.6 million is to come from the property tax base, representing a 5.2 increase, and this includes one net new position, which is for the staffing at the Southwest branch. Next slide, please. 
Our 2023 capital priorities, as reflected in the budget request, uh, include the renovations that are currently underway at the Gore Meadows Library branch and the planned renovations at the South Fletcher's branch, branch, in addition to continuing our work on the City Library, which is part of the Centre for Innovation, and also planning further branch expansion into underserved areas of Brampton. Next slide. This chart shows the breakdown between tax-based and development charges in the library's capital budget. So in conclusion, we think that this is a modest and responsible request that will help the library make progress on its goals to serve our vibrant and successful community. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. And uh, do any members have any questions? Do we have any questions online? Okay, do I need a motion to, yeah, I'll have a motion by Councillor Pleshi to receive the delegations. Anybody opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that carries. Next up we have staff report, 8.2.38.1, Brampton Transit Fair Change. <coughs> Who's uh, presenting? Sorry, um, to the chair. There was no presentation material. It was all part of our budget uh, presentation. This okay. is just yeah. uh, um, receiving and uh, approving sure. the recommendations here as part of the whole budget process. Okay, no problem. I'll have a motion moved by Councillor Powers uh, to receive the staff report. Anybody opposed? Approve to approve the staff report. Is anybody opposed? Hearing and seeing none, that carries. I have. Yeah. Yeah. Through you, Mr. Chair, just bear with me here for a moment. I'm just going to bring up the item and the report. So the report is essentially setting out uh, a modest fare increase as discussed during the budget presentation and making the appropriate amendment to the user fee bylaw. So, So the recommendations are setting out the Brampton Transit fares and related charges to be approved to set out in Appendix B to the report starting in, in Q2 2023 and making the appropriate amend amendment to Schedule G of the user fee bylaw. Okay, now that was already passed, so we'll move on to 8.2, staff report regarding recreation cost analysis for free older adult programming. Do any members have any questions? I see Councillor Santos on the board. Councillor Santos, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and through you, um, Mr. Chair, uh, went through the report and uh, have a motion for councillors to consider. And I just, I did send that over to the clerk. Yeah, so you through you, Mr. Chair, yes, there is a report, 8.2, which is on the agenda. It was published with the revised agenda uh, yesterday. It's a report on recreation cost analysis for free and old, free older adult programming. And I'll just bring up in a moment, Councillor Santos, your motion. Uh, the item through you, Mr. Chair, was distributed with the revised agenda that was published um, uh, between 12.30 and 1 o'clock yesterday afternoon, I believe it was, before Budget Committee started its deliberations. Thank you. 
Thank you, and um, I believe that uh, I'm happy to to move this with uh, Councillor Tor, Councillor Barr as uh, seconders. So we do have a user fee study happening currently in 2023, um, and uh, based on that user fee survey or study, uh, we're hoping for staff to incorporate a, f a future um, for 2024, 2025, 2026 um, free recreation fees for seniors. Because we're already going through the process on, on user fees, we might as well incorporate this into it now as well to better understand the, the impact and also better understand um, how much use is that we're, the seniors will be making of the free recreation. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Uh, does anybody have any questions regarding the motion? Uh, do we have anything online? You, Mr. Chair, I do not see any at the moment. Nope. nope. Okay. So we have a motion moved by Councillor Santos uh, for the staff report to come at uh, the upcoming user fee study. Uh, is anybody opposed? Oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, okay, Councillor Plesche. No, just really briefly, Mr. Chair, I wanted to thank Councillor Santos for um, for bringing this to our attention to work for working on this. We heard a lot about this in uh, uh, you know during the election, meeting with uh, countless seniors groups. Um, so wanted to thank her for putting all the effort into um, bringing this forward, keeping us surprised, and, and managing it. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Councillor Santos. Thank you for your words. Okay, we have a motion moved by Councillor Santos. Is anybody opposed? Hearing and seeing none, the motion carries. Moving on to other and new business, we have 10.1, which was supplementary information report regarding the 2023 proposed operating and capital budgets, uh, pre-budget discussions, and we have uh, a public engagement handout. So, Mr. Chair, if there's no questions on those, those would just be a motion just to receive those 10.1 okay. and 10.2. I have a motion by Councillor Keenan to receive the new and other business. Is anybody opposed? Hearing and seeing none, the motion carries. Um, to the clerk for clarification, do we move on to committee questions, debate, and consideration of reports and correspondence? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, although we've basically dealt with all the business yeah. on the um, the budget committee agenda, save and except for two delegations scheduled for this evening at seven o'clock. Yeah. And then it's just consideration of the respective departmental budgets and the overall budget. So would that be better to do at seven or to start it now? So, I, I, I'm agreeing with seven. If that's the will of committee? Yeah, that is probably better. Yep. Okay, so I guess I'll take a motion to recess. Okay, I have a motion moved by Councillor Pleshi. He doesn't like the uh, Councillor Powers to recess. recess. Okay, Councillor Fleshy to recess. Is anybody opposed? <laughs> Hearing and seeing none, that carries. We will meet at seven o'clock tonight.